Hello, my dear friends. How is it going? I'm Mari Ferger, and today I'm here to talk about the common misconceptions that the Celts built megalithic monuments. It is a rather strange notion, but it seems it is still very common to find all sorts of websites and even books talking about the Celts and their connection to the megalithic structures of the Neolithic. And it's not just in esoteric books that we find this sort of information, mind you. This fantasy has been consolidated in such a way that it often passes as common knowledge and even historical truth on many discussions, books, websites, several mediums of all sorts. I come from a country, Portugal, which is, let's say, uh, rich in both megalithic structures and also Celtic heritage. Both are not connected at all. <laughs> These are two cultural developments with a wide temporal space between them. Perhaps I may be a little bit more acquainted with this fact, who knows, maybe because, <laughs> I don't know, um, I'm both an archaeologist and, well, Portugal is the country where you will find the oldest megalithic monuments in the world, as well as the greater number. And we shall get to, to that in a moment, don't worry. However, surprisingly, and yet not surprisingly at all, even in Portugal, many people often make an immediate connection between the Celts and the megalithic uh, monuments. It is yet another one of those phenomena of historical myths created in the 18th and 19th centuries to look for an ancient cultural heritage in order to push forward a nationalist narrative as far back as possible in time to prove that a modern people belongs to a land based on the history that took place on the more recent geographical notions of a country completely discarding thousands of years of cultures and ethnic groups that came and went and shared space with each other in completely different perceptions of what constituted territory in the past. Well then, the Celts are still closely associated with European megaliths, uh, as we can see, or still see today, on travel websites, tourist guides, and of course in a large amount of esoteric literature and also being a myth widely disseminated by amateur researchers. For instance, I have plenty of books on Neo-Druidry, um, New Age esoteric magic of all sorts, and such other literary works that often make this connection between Celts and megalithic monuments. Uh, that, uh, that doesn't bother me as much these days. Uh, what bothers me are tourist guides and travel websites that keep pushing this fantasy. They are smart, mind you, and they know it attracts tourists, the, these fantasies and the, the romanticism around the Celts. However, it creates a lot of uh, misinformation, misconceptions that may have dangerous outcomes, actually. But from an historical point of view, it's, it's rather unfair, let's say, to credit a culture for something they haven't done and completely deny the amazing achievements of other cultures. It's like saying the aliens built the pyramids, right? Um, it, it, it is still uh, very common in the most different uh, media networks and outlets for, for the Celts and consequently the Druids to be represented as the altars of the great stone structures of Europe. Uh, this idea originated during the phenomenon of Celtomania in the 19th century, which popularized the, the, that, that theory, this theory, at a time when archaeology had not yet been fully developed and there were not yet proper scientific studies on these places and megalithic structures, which were then interpreted as merely spaces of sacrifices and mysterious cults. <laughs> 
archaeology did not become an actual science and an actual field of human and social sciences before the 1950s. I would say 99% of archaeology done before that period was purely by amateurs, mostly grave robbers, uh, the great majority of them belonging to the European aristocracy, which saw archaeology as a prestigious hobby. Archaeology before the 1950s was, was, a, was a hobby among the elites, the same elites highly involved in political affairs in a time period of great effort for each European country or nation uh, to construct a, f a fixed notion of cultural heritage that could not only extol each population of each country, but to also create an alternative fictional history that could be used as justification for a nation to expand their borders because their ancestors had been there. This is what in part formed the phenomenon of Celtomania as well as other similar phenomena linked to other very modern notions of culture and ethnicity. And without the archaeological methodology that would later on finally be formed, uh, most nations, most countries could simply say whatever they wanted about their own historical past. Anyway, the association of the Celts with these structures, the megaliths, the, the megalithic structures, still occurs today uh, due to their uh, mystical nature, creating a, a great popular appeal. To put things into perspective, the oldest megalithic monuments in Europe, and many of them are the oldest in the, in the world, are found in Portugal, today's Portugal, uh, let's say in the extreme west of the Iberian Peninsula, in what would become Portugal in the early Middle Ages, uh, with the oldest, the, these old, the oldest monuments of this type being in the Atlantic coastal area and in the center uh, of Portugal. Uh, or our present day Portuguese territory. The oldest man here in the world so far, the oldest standing stone, right, uh, is called Menir de Miada. Man, uh, Miada's man here or standing stone, right, in Portugal, uh, which I'll show you on the screen uh, an image here, which, which I've actually shown you in the past when I have recorded a video about a totally different subject concerning paganism. This standing stone's dating goes back almost to the sixth millennium before the Common Era. Therefore, we are talking about a structure of the megalithic phenomenon that occurred more than 4,000 years before the Celts, before any vestige of Celtic culture in mainland Europe and anywhere else for that matter. Now, when looking at the megalithic phenomenon, uh, we do have the perception that it started or it developed in the extreme west of the Iberian Peninsula, developing further east and north along the Atlantic. To put things into even more perspective, it's not just the oldest megalithic monuments uh, you can explore and find in the extreme west of the Iberian Peninsula, but it's also the largest number of them. And I should say, and this may give a little sting in the soul of every historian, archaeologist, anthropologist and any other enthusiast of history and of the megalithic phenomenon. More than 80% of the megalithic structures within the territory of Portugal were destroyed and used as quarry over the centuries. Yet, it's still the territory where you can find the greatest number of megalithic structures. We can only imagine how the landscape must have looked like when all of them were here, were still around. <laughs> uh, it must have been quite impressive. However, uh, and back to the, the subject, the main subject of this video, when talking about Celts, the great academic focus arises precisely from the phenomenon of Celtomania in the 19th century, giving great popularity to the Celtic peoples of the British Isles, which in fact the Celtization of the British Isles occurred in a very late period in the Iron Age, so late that the continental Celts no longer existed during this period. But speaking of the British Isles and their megalithic monuments, I will indeed show you some monuments um, normally associated with the Celts, although of course uh, they were erected in periods long before the Celtization of the British Isles 
and of course therefore uh, belonging to other peoples uh, from different periods who took the phenomenon of uh, megalithism into the British Isles. But it is no coincidence, mind you, that the Celtomania and studies on the Celts focuses much more on the British Isles than anywhere else, despite Celticism coming quite late into the British Isles. The great majority of studies on Celts comes from the British perspective. This is an error we have seen over many decades, uh, in the past two centuries, actually, from the part of many historians, and, and even in the past, let's say, a hundred years or so, from the part of archaeologists, which is this the, 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 to project modern notions of civilization, culture, and geographical delimitations of a country into the past, as if the people of the past were confined to the exact same notions and the same modern spaces. And much knowledge is unfortunately completely disregarded, denied, and even not taken into the studies. Anyway, uh, here's an example. The Clava Cairns in Scotland, a magnificent circular chamber tomb built in the Bronze Age, dating back to around 2000 before the Common Era, as such, <laughs> long before the Celts. Currently, this monument has become quite popular due to the Outlander series, and the continuous Celtic Romanticism. Look at these two gorgeous birds. Anyway, the Celts did not build this, of course. It was still a long way until Celtic cultural influences would reach the British Isles when this monument was actually built. Another example, uh, of course, uh, the famous Stonehenge, uh, England, the most famous stone circle in the world, strongly associated uh, in the imagination, of course, with the Druids, but created in a period ranging from 3,100 to 1,600 before the Common Era. Currently, researchers believe that the site was built by three people at different times, Neolithic farmers, the Beaker culture and the Wessex culture. However, I should say, um, not only as an archaeologist, of course, but also as someone who is very much interested in the truth, even though it may be very disappointing and it, it hurts my feelings sometimes. Stonehenge, as we know it today, uh, its shape and the arrangement of the stones and how it is being presented or displayed is actually something far more recent in history. There were three moments of the project of rebuilding Stonehenge. First in 1901, then in 1919 and finally in 1958 being this year the great change and the most extensive works of putting together Stonehenge. I'm not talking about rebuilding the original mon monument, right? I'm talking about creating a modern interpretation. The site was cleared of all the stones and then rebuilt. Only then the site was excavated and much later the heavy equipment and machinery came back in. And then the stones were placed in remade holes, mind you. Sadly, Stonehenge, as we see today, is nothing more than a modern representation of an ancient monument because it was dismantled and rebuilt. Yet, guidebooks, history books, official documents still say that Stonehenge was built 4,000 years ago. But as we see today, we, we are, was actually built in, the in 1958. There was a megalithic monument, an original one, mind you, obviously, probably dating back to the period ranging from 3100 to 1600 before the Common Era, as said before, but at this point there's no way of telling how the original Stonehenge was actually arranged and how it was actually aligned, because the transformations of the 1950s completely changed the monument forever, even its own foundations, which are made of concrete, modern concrete. This is not the only ancient monument uh, that has been altered in recent years, mind you, and sadly. Stonehenge, uh, the actual ancient monument, was destroyed. If this information bothers you and you are starting to question everything you thought you knew about Stonehenge and, um, I mean, every fantasy associated with it, welcome to the club. Unfortunately, um, we do not have cookies, only modern concrete, dust and sadness. Now imagine that. There's people today, still alive and walking about, older than Stone Age. See?
Mas se pode ir para aqui, não tem mal nenhum. Another fabulous monument is Newgrange, Ireland, a circular tomb with passage built in 3200 before the Common Era by Neolithic farmers. The case of the Celts in Ireland has been a long debate because Although some geographical areas of Europe have clear evidences of Celtic artistic presence and culture and heritage, not all of these areas actually had Celts, the Celts, but rather people who adopted Celtic cultural aspects through several contexts and incorporated them into, the, into their culture, cultures. Uh, the vast majority of Irish academics and researchers today prefer to refer to the people and cultures of Iron Age Ireland not as Celts but as Old Irish or better still Ancient Irish before the Old Irish. <laughs> and to finalize this and to probably give another stab in the soul, the famous the Druids Temple of Swinton, North Yorkshire, England, nothing to do with the Druids, much less with the Celts. It was built in 1800 by the writer William Danby, uh, imitating Stonehenge or what was known at the time as Stonehenge before the construction of the 1950s, which despite having some similarities with what we see more or less today concerning Stonehenge, at the same time is totally different. Well, both due to, to being different before the rebuilt, but it also has a, a more romantic perspective by the writer who commissioned this construction. This is the, the great product of Celtomania and many people still share photographs of this place as being authentically Celtic. Fake news isn't something uh, recent of our contemporary time. They have always existed and have been taught and still are taught in schools as the truth. Makes you wonder, right, how many more lies we have been told and what else are we going to uncover? <laughs> and as an archaeologist myself, and um, after 11 years, honestly, thinking about quitting for good and forever, I've seen my fair share of historical fantasies and fake monstrosities. In those terms, my perception of such subjects has greatly changed, even more, when I was restoring archaeological materials and the person teaching me all of that, all of those methods, had worked on an antique shop for 40 years, making all sorts of fake historical artifacts so perfect that you cannot possibly say they, they are not fake. Without, of course, a deep analysis in a proper lab. And uh, some very beautiful fake artifacts are on display on many history museums all over the world. You kind of lose the magic when face to face with these realities. Someone once said, history is but a fable agreed upon. <laughs> anyway, um, I do hope this video was useful and an eye opener. Stay sharp. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> See you on the next video. And as always, thank you for today. Until we meet again, my dear friends.